again, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, put the questions in the chat box of, or ask later. And so all of you know what to do. Uh, all the uh, and again, if I see any disturbance, then I may mute you. Uh, uh, Salka, is it okay if people keep the videos on? Okay. Sure, absolutely. It's absolutely okay. fine. Okay, good. Okay. okay, go ahead, Alka. Yep. First of all, thank you so much, Kaka. This is a great opportunity for me, and it's always an honor to be on this platform because I started from this platform uh, when I was achieving towards the BCHN because we have few hours which we have to note it down uh, for the live presentations as well. So just as Kaka mentioned, we have a few credentials which you see, but I'm no more, no more close to what experts over here are. I'm trying my best what I was being taught what, what my, with my mentors, just sharing that knowledge with, uh, with you all. Uh, I do have my uh, practice at Juno Wellness at uh, my, doc my doctor's pharmacy in Herndon, Virginia. Uh, I'm also on the uh, uh, the conventional side at the compounding pharmacy, uh, but that's not what we are going to talk about today. It's all about the holistic nutrition and uh, what, how we can control. And I'm uh, with the uh, being a registered herbalist. I'm trained in um, mainly in Ayurved, um, also Western herbalism and traditional Chinese medicine. So basically, this presentation is just for the educational purposes, just to know everybody should know what our bodies are made up of. How our bodies function that's our uh, i would say this is our basic right to know what we are made up of and how we function overall so this should not be taken as a medical advice you can use some of this information to ask questions to your providers and before making any changes to your diet or your supplements especially if you are under any kind of a medical supervision always please consult your physician or your primary care provider before making any of the changes Okay, so let's start with some basic information, what we should be knowing about the hypertension, what hypertension is, how it has been measured, what exactly is, uh, usually goes on inside our heart when we are talking about the hypertension. So it's a common disorder of a blood pressure when it is elevated, when it is a little on the higher side of the numbers. So it's, and blood pressure overall, it's one of the very natural phenomena of life be, be, uh, without that. The oxygen uh, is, which will not be distributed towards the cells and tissues and also the unwanted carbon dioxide will not be taken out along with the water vapor uh, outside our bodies. So this is a particular force which is generated by our heart in the form of the contraction and relaxation. So it's a blood which is flowing through all our, uh, all our system inside our system with the help of our heart. So this is just a general diagram. We are not going to go again in the detail, but as I said, this is, this is a basic thing which we all must have learned when we were in high school or even in uh, when you are going towards the science section, that this is something in the science streams we all uh, learn about. So there are four major chambers in our heart. The heart is divided into four chambers, uh, the atriums and the ventricles. So there are two atriums and two ventricles, the left and right of each. The right ventricle is, uh, by using the right ventricle, basically the heart actually sends the, uh, the blood, the lungs for the purification. Then purified blood is actually received at the left atrium. And then from left our ventricle, it is pushed towards all over the body for further circulation inside. And then uh, the, the overall the circulation starts or overall circulation happens. That's a general, general idea. And it all happens together. Like, uh, contraction and relaxation of ventricles and also the atriums are happening at the same time. It's not like one is waiting for the second one. It's not like that. It's always happening like that. So it's both together. But the ventricles and atriums are contracting at the same time, relaxing at the same time. Now, there are two types of usually pressures which we see that even when you're going towards your or to your doctor or even when you have a blood pressure machine at home, there are two numbers which you usually see on your blood pressure machine. One is called a systolic, the other one is called as diastolic. So what exactly that systolic means, it's just the contraction of the force, which the left ventricle, the left side of the ventricle or the left ventricle uh, to move the blood through the artery. So when that pure blood is coming, uh, it is pushed to, towards the artery. So that force is called as the systolic force. That during the contraction, the force is always, always higher. So if say, for example, if you are doing a breathing exercise, so have a deep breathing or to uh, exhale the force into the uh, with the pressure you always need like 
you're pushing in the air, you're actually making sure that the force is higher there, only then you can release the pressure out. So the diastolic is an expansion force of those ventricles to receive the blood again from the left atrium. So it's contracting, relaxing, relaxing, contracting, relaxing, it's happening at the same time. So unless and until there is a force, this, the blood is not going to push towards or push inside for the purification also. So the diastolic is during that expansion force, which has been, and usually the expansion force is the reduction, a little bit reduced than the contraction force. So that's why the diastolic numbers you will see they are lower in comparison to the systolic numbers. Now there is another term which we, and these terms you don't have to remember, this is just for your general information. Whenever you go to your doctor's offices, there are these things which are been noted down. And even sometimes the stroke volume is something which you should be aware of what exactly the stroke volume is, how the things change when you are in particular position. So stroke volume is nothing but the measurement of the heart, uh, which is the heart actually is giving you the output of. So the volume of the blood, which is pumped by the ventricles per every minute in the arteries, that is basically the stroke volume. So each contraction or the each beat, two ventricles, like those two ventricles are pumping out nearly 70 mLs of the, or 70 mLs is approximately 14 teaspoons of blood. Now the whole, it's 100% filled, but not the whole blood is out. So usually it's only 70% to 60% which comes out. So 70 mLs per, per beat. And at the rest, when you are actually laying down on the bed, when you are at the sleeping position, at rest, your heart is actually beating 70 times per minute. And again, this is the general number. It can change in certain conditions. But in general, 70 times is the heartbeat per minute. Now, normally, the, when the cardiac output is at rest, just imagine 70 multiplied by 70. So 70 mLs uh, is being pumped 70 times. So it's approximately 4,900 mLs, which is close to 5 liters of the blood usually gets circulated, which is our overall circulation is happening about the 5 liters of blood, pushing it all over our bodies. Now, where this, this happens when you are actually resting. When it's a standing position or when you are si just sitting also, overall that, that output increases from 5 liters to 6 liters. So instead of pumping the 5 liters, when you are doing any activities like for now, we are all sitting together. So it's usually the 6 liters of the blood which is getting circulated. Now, when a person does a little extra effort to do the light exercises, now, during those light exercises, approximately that six liters changes to 20 liters of the blood per minute. And this is again the approximate numbers I'm giving you. When a person is doing light exercises to a heavy exercises, usually when you see the athletes, they are actually pumping the blood about 35 liters per minute. So it's a very, very heavy pumping going on. So blood has to like, it, the heart has to work really hard in that position. So blood pressure also incre always rather increases with the cardiac output. Whenever you are doing exercises or when you are uh, climbing the stairs, when you're climbing the uh, elevations, you are you're always have that uh, high heartbeat going on. So because that time your heart is actually pumping uh, harder than what it was at the rest. Now, this is another term you usually see or hear from the doctors. This is called as elastic recoil of the arteries. And again, these terms, as I said, you don't have to remember. This is just for the information. This is the temporary expansion of the, every artery has the capacity to expand and to come back to normal. So that elasticity is always there in our arteries. So that diastolic pressure, which indicates the degree of the elastic uh, recoil, uh, that pressure is called as diastolic pressure. And systolic pressure is the measurement of the force which the heart pumps the blood. It's like how much of the, how much heart or how much force has been created is the diastolic. Now you all must have seen that when the blood pressure is taken, the blood pressure is always taken into the branchial artery right here in between your, uh, next to your elbow. You can see in the picture also, right? When you bend your elbow, that's the point where the, the branchial artery has been located and that's where the blood pressure is usually taken. Now, one big mistake we, um, which is commonly seen that people do when they are taking the blood pressure is usually they keep their hands down or either they are, uh, I mean, if they are sitting like that, so if you are putting your hands down, that's not the right way of taking your blood pressure. It can give you the wrong readings. 
So always, whenever you're taking your blood pressure, the best way is either to keep your um, hand at this, almost at the level of where your heart is, or the other thing, which I have seen uh, many doctors doing it as well, or we have a doc physician on board as well. So what he prefers is to, if somebody is uh, standing in front of you to take your blood pressure, you actually put your hand on the shoulder of that person and then take the blood pressure. That gives you the exactly same uh, height towards the, uh, you know, the, the, similar to your, or parallel to your heart. So that, that is the older way of taking it, but at least you can try uh, putting your hand at rest and very close to the same level as your heart rather than putting it down. But when you put your hands down, that's gonna give you the wrong reading. Now, aging is one of the other factors when you will see the blood pressure rising or blood pressure is little elevated in comparison to when you were young. So that happens usually because the elasticity of the arterial walls are changing. When you are aging, the walls are not that elastic as it used to be. There are multiple other reasons also, but that's one of the other causes of having the uh, little elevated pressure in the uh, ger geriatric uh, population. So that will have a little bit of uh, different blood pressure in comparison to the young person. Now, this is the one which from here onwards, we are gonna talk about the, uh, the measures and how to take care of certain things, how Ayurveda uh, plays its role about that. So now arterial plaque, one of the basic, or what you say, one of the most common causes or the silent culprit you can talk about that that which which uh, plays its role towards the elevation of the blood pressure and not just that, but when the the actual path gets narrowed uh, between the arteries arteries, then the then further cause is the myocardial infracture with or also called as a heart attack. So this plaque actually does not build up immediately, like within a year or within two years. This plaque built up, which is a cholesterol built up, it starts maybe 10 years, 15 years, it's not immediately, it's it's a slow process. And there are various factors involved and everybody has plaque, of course, every all of us will have a plaque inside our arteries, which is common. But the amount of plaque, which is, uh, which needs to, you know, the proper the proper flow, if that's not there, if it has been building there, and we are not gonna go in that uh, details yet because we don't have much time, we, that's another section we can do about the arthrosclerosis, but that's a different, the complete, diff, complete different uh, phenomena. There are different ways of controlling it, but uh, we are gonna cover a little bit of uh, what to do in these categories as well. But that is the first thing we all have to take care about. And especially with people who have uh, cardiometabolic syndrome, uh, considering uh, especially the diabetes or kidney diseases, those are the, those are the individuals which should be especially careful about uh, taking you know, the measure towards the hypertension, basically controlling the hypertensions as well. Now, there are two different types of hypertensions which are uh, which are understood or rather other which are recognized. So there is a primary hypertension and there is a secondary hypertension. So primary hypertension is also known as a essential hypertension. So for that particular uh, type of hypertension, there is no specific cause detected yet, or there is no particular cause which can say this is the reason why it must have happened. So, and whenever a person comes to a doctor's office uh, saying that I have a high blood pressure, especially the person who is in his 40s or uh, probably sometimes in the 30s also, uh, you will see that or the, in the blood work, usually it is seen uh, that the nor, norepinephrine, which is a flight or flight responsive uh, hormone, that number is always a very high number. And the, that could be because of the mental stress, which is, an, which is a very leading cause right now, which is pushing a person more towards uh, going into a hypertensive board at the young ages. Uh, anxiety is another issue. Uh, then our environmental, environmental oxidative stress, that is uh, sometimes even a consumption of alcohol. Social media is putting a lot of pressure because of that people are not sleeping on time because of the, uh, especially the IT professionals, you can see they're working way too many hours at once. And because of that, the mental stress and oxidative stress is also building up inside, which is a very, very silent cause. And it's not specially seen uh, during, uh, or rather it is not usually or rather even noticed or identified by a person as well. So that's usually a primary thing. And by doing a certain changes in their lifestyles, uh, the primary blood pressure usually can bring uh, easily under control. The secondary blood pressure, which has been seen, 
or the secondary hypertension, sorry, the causative factors are not the, the, the heart as per se, but because of the other problems depending upon the organs, like there are uh, kidneys which are having, if somebody has a chronic kidney disease or endocrine system, so endocrine system covers mainly the diabetes type two, basically. And there are some brain, um, uh, you know, brain diseases related or uh, impairments of certain things in the brain, uh, brain structures as well. So that can actually goes or is one of the causes for the secondary uh, hypertension. And there are different ways of controlling it. Uh, obesity is a very, very common cause for the secondary hypertension. And uh, obviously the sedentary lifestyle, if you're not moving, no exercises, just sitting at one place, whatever you're eating, not getting digested. And um, it's there is no um, there's no movement of your body at all. That, that is another cause of the secondary hypertension. Now, there are some uh, identified other causes, um, consumption of very, very dry or very cold food. So that's why usually we, whenever we are writing the protocols, we uh, try to let people know that do not consume a lot of dry food. And the reason for that is sometimes the dry foods uh, which we eat here are normally very high in salt. And when you are eating a lot of salt overall, that is another, and we are going to cover that in, in a in few minutes about the potassium and sodium ratios and all. So if you are eat, uh, consuming a lot of dry and cold food, that is another possible causes of having a hypertension at the early ages as well. Over-exercising is one of the most challenging things which are facing right now. So whenever we are seeing our clients or also our patients coming to the pharmacy as well, uh, there are, especially the young generation, they think that when you're exercising overly, that can actually give them a, a benefit towards uh, lean bodies and you know perfect shapes. Of course, exercise does matter. There is definitely a benefit towards the exercise, but there is a limit to how much you can do and how much you can bear because everybody's body is different. Uh, just one person is doing something, you cannot copy the same thing for the same from the other person. So over-exercise is another cause. Remember, whenever there is an exercise, whenever there is an activity, your, your heart is actually pushing really hard to, to keep up with your overall circulations. Then third and main cause, which we are seeing as well, is the unhealthy sleep patterns. If you are sleeping at the time where your food is getting digested or supposed to be getting digested, which is after the 10 o'clock, uh, 10 p.m. time, there is, uh, if you see most of our youth, there nobody sleeps at 10. If you see about 70% of the time, their sleeping times are about 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. 2 That's their normal, normal sleeping times. So these are the unhealthy sleep patterns because then you're, they're waking up also sometimes late. So the time where they are supposed to have a healthy breakfast, they're skipping the breakfast and skip, uh, jumping directly to the lunch. And then nutritionally, they are getting deficient about certain things, especially at the age where they need a complete nutrition. Now, excessive consumption of alcohol because of the social pressures and because of these, uh, you know, uh, the, the like a high, high society things going on and they are thinking that, uh, Having a glass of wine and having, I'm sorry about uh, being too blunt about these things, but personally in our household, there is no alcohol served for any uh, particular, uh, you know, celebrations. And uh, when there's an excessive consumption of alcohol, there is a, this is another cause because that is becoming more like a fashion of having um, or drinking, somebody is drinking excessive alcohol that makes them different from the others. So that's another cause which we have been seeing. There are some food irregularities that you are either eating too spicy or you're eating too sweet, or like there are extremities of the foods. You're not having a complete food group, which is actually needed to keep yourself healthy. So these are one of the possible causes which are being identified. Now, how do you identify whether you are having actually a uh, sign? Because your body is always, always before it actually hits the actual, uh, uh, what you say, the essential organs inside, or which are the vital organs inside, it always gives you the first indications. And that is something we all should understand that why if the body, if this is something, if something's going wrong, we need to identify that and make sure that you, you actually address that and talk to your physician uh, or your pro 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 provider, whoever, whoever you are seeing, that this could be the sometimes over, uh, you know, the overthink, not overthinking, but having over precautions is better than having no precaution at all. So for general signs and symptoms, you usually start getting a headache. There's extreme weakness. 
then you will have some dizziness going on, especially when you stand or, um, or sudden standing or sudden laying down, that giddiness is there. Sleeplessness, the person cannot sleep at all. There are lots of palpitations. When you are, even when you are climbing the stairs, your heart will go like palpitate so hard. Let's, it's, it's just, uh, you can actually hear your heartbeats. So that's another thing, digestive disorders. And we'll go to that, uh, uh, that point, why digestive disorders also. And then fatigue with even the normal activities, like you're folding clothes, or if you're going from uh, one room to the other, or if you're just climbing 10 steps, that is actually making you fatigued or tired just by doing small work. Uh, dizziness, as we mentioned also, that the extreme dizziness sometimes, and shortness of breath. These are just the general signs and symptoms. Yeah, there are other uh, causes also that other problems also, which are associated with these symptoms, they are overlapping. But this is something which is most commonly related to the hypertension. You can always uh, address these symptoms and, and then talk to your provider if you have one of any of these symptoms, you're uh, rather seeing it constantly. There's another thing which we are uh, which we see commonly is sometimes ringing in your ears. If something is going on and the, the, that ringing is, is not stopping, uh, some people actually experience vertigo as well. So these symptoms needs to be addressed that, that it could be because of the, that the, if the, it's not just the hypertension, it could be related to any underlying other issues like secondary hypertension, it could be with other organs also. So always make sure you are actually talking to your provider about this. Now, this is the beautiful part. Now, Ayurveda actually explains this beautifully and this is something we all should relate to because we come from the, uh, most of us come from the same uh, same roots. So Ayurveda, we, in Ayurveda, we all know that the there is a tissue system. First of all, there are five forces, uh, five universal forces with our bodies are made up of. That is uh, mainly Prithvi, Jala, Akash, Vayu, and Agni. So those are five forces which are condensed into three doshas, Vata dosha, Pitta dosha, and Kapha dosha. Then those, those three doshas are mainly all the uh, the organs have their impacts, uh, their, their impact on other organs, their impact on our bodies. Every organ has their own primary doshas. There are sub doshas. And uh, 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 apart from those, there are seven bodily tissues, which are the primary, uh, we can say, base foundations of other things or how to uh, sometimes to know some prapti of the, um, of the disease, which has been understood through these tissues. So there is a plasma tissue or, or Russell dhatu, which is called as plasma or lymphatic system. Rakta, which is blood, muscles is mansa, meda is adipose tissues, asthi is bones, majja is marrows or nerve tissues, and shukra or uh, artva is a male or female reproductive system. So we are going to focus mainly on uh, rakta dhatu today because rakta dhatu has a strong connection towards the hypertension. So rakta dhatu is nothing but the blood. Now in Western theory, theory uh, blood is recognized as, as mainly the plasma in comparison to the blood, blood, blood cells. In uh, Rakta Dhatu, uh, which is the part of Ayurveda is mainly, which includes only red blood cells. And it's the red blood cells in the heart and the blood vessels. So that is called as a Rakta Dhatu. And we are going to go one slide back again. So remember, all these Dhatus have their connections towards each other. So when you start eating your food, whatever you eat, uh, the, whatever is the benefit towards your food, that's going to get absorbed in the, uh, that is the form of rasa, or that is the, what you say, nectar, that gets, uh, gets towards rakta, then it starts building your muscles, further it starts building your adipose tissues, further is your bones, further inside your marrows and nerve tissues, and all the way inside your male and the female reproductive organs. So basically what you eat gives you the end results of your uh, even to your reproductive system, when you are in a in a uh, age where you are actually producing a second life, so whatever you eat actually gets passed on to the person you are actually giving a birth as well. So it's not just the women; it's actually the part of men and women both. So whenever you are, uh, and sometimes by the time we understand these things, we are at the age where these things have passed. So uh, it's our job basically to let our kids or our next generation to know the importance of this system. Because these systems, the, uh, the original the medical system, the conventional systems are all origin have originated from these things. This has been more for the self-taught and the, because of the long meditation processes. And this is unbelievable, the way this knowledge has come to, uh, to us 
it's uh, it's it's just the divine thing it's absolutely not possible with, with without this you know that self force that self knowledge force or the that awareness thoughtful awareness we call it as it's a very very strong knowledge which has been passed to us and we are very very uh, what you say lucky to have come from that system now as moving to the rakta dhatu as we talked about this is a red blood cells now uh, switching the gears say talking about the types of vata we talked about three different forces like vata pitta and kapha now why we are talking more about vata because we will be talking mainly about rakta vata which is important for the hypertension now there are sub types of vata which is prana vata udana vata udana vata vayu prana vayu udana vayu samana vayu apana vayu and avayan vayu so all these vata sub, sub types of vatas also have the dominating elements so prana vayu's dominating element is ether udana vayu is uh, is air samana vayu is fire apana vayu is earth and vayan vayu is water now prana vayu is mainly downward force but downwards but inwards so it's going in and down which is a space filling to the spaces inside your brain now udana vayu is upward movement to the diaphragm and your throat the samana vayu is linear so it's spl splitting in the, inside the small intestine all the way to the navel finally the apana vayu which is downwards and outwards so it's uh, basically at the colon and the pelvis and vayan vayu is the circulation so the whole circulatory force that is the pulsation in the heart and the body now this is an interesting thing which i just came across uh, uh, about this especially about this uh, this slide so if you remember whenever we are actually offering a bhog or when we are in marathi we call it as naivedya we are doing any offering to the god or to any of the divine uh, you know divine force which we worship we usually uh, in sanskrit there are we take the take some water and just go around the naivedya or offering and we say om pranaya swaha om vanaya swaha om apanaya swaha om samanaya swaha om udanaya swaha so what does that mean what is the meaning of that there is a strong meaning behind it so the first one or the first pran which we call it as the uh, the first the first bite we call it as it is for the pranaya swaha so pranaya is the one which actually you are you are taking the food inside and that has been satisfied it's actually one of the first thing we taste so when you are it's it's a simple example when you are uh, taking a first bite if it is spicy of uh, or if it is uh, you know um, it is bitter the first thing is been noticed is in your eyes your eyes will start watering ooh it's so spicy and the, the water starts coming from your eyes so that's the first thing which you actually experience so that's a prana which swallows the food the second one is the vayana om vayana vayana swaha so vanaya is nothing but you whatever you have swallowed it's reaching to your stomach and it retains or it remains in your stomach the third offering which we call it as apanaya swaha so apanaya swaha is the one which are the, the the one which is needed is already there and one which is not needed has to be taken out from your system and that is nothing but the force of vata which is called as apanavayu which is been which is useful to take that thing out of your system the next one is o samana yaswaha so the food which is digested now which is sitting in your stomach or uh, sitting in your uh, overall body which has been uh, distributed or something which is uh, which is more nutritive so that is the uh, the digestive part of it is called as samana yaswaha and the last one or the fifth offering is nothing but the the udana yaswaha so udana is the part where actually have all the nutrients which are coming it's into your blood and into your flesh so that's the whole reason of offering when we are actually offering food it's not just that but it's actually praying to those elements that whatever i'm eating should also get distributed properly so it's a blessing we are actually offering to those five elements or asking the five elements to give it to us now moving to that function of rakta dhatu which we were talking about now we say that whatever you are eating from rasa dhatu that nutrient transportation from your tract your gastrointestinal tract uh so whatever is needed it should get distributed to different organs now that transportation is done by pranavayu which is the life energy respiration oxygenation circulation and that that actually happens from your lungs that pure blood is been uh, taken out from the lungs or from the lungs it goes to the heart and then it gets distributed from our chambers so that outward direct distribution towards the body from the heart to the cells inside our body is been done by vayana vata 
or uh, uh, vayana vayana vayu we saw it as and the last one we have just saw that apan vayu which is involvement of the waste products which we need to be taken out of of our system it will have an elimination of the uh, un unwanted things or then impure blood carrying back to that, that carbon dioxide uh, involving involved blood gets carried back to the lungs for the purification now when we are describing the importance of uh, i mean basically the description of the rakta dhatu uh, and again this remember this all these descriptions are coming from the uh, the, the scriptures of from the ayurveda this is not the time when they actually had microscopes to see what has been going on so just imagine just by self knowledge from the strong meditations and the universal uh, what do you say sadhana this is what has been given to us from our ancestors so the description of the blood is there it is hot it is sour and it's slightly pungent and has a metallic taste if you have ever ever had a time the the chance like if you have a little cut and if you don't have anything else what we do is first thing we put our uh, whatever is the area we put it in our mouth and you must have if you have tasted it it's always has a metallic taste to it or blood has the metallic taste to it and that's because of the presence of hemoglobin in there the so the, again the, remember this thing has been explained everything in the ayurvedic literatures this is the part we are talking about now when we are in the <clears throat> modern world now blood also provides us or rakta dhatu provides us the energy it provides us the longevity and it provides us the warmness inside so people who are deficient in blood they are always cold their hands will be cold their feet will be cold they'll have they are always like even in the during the summer season you will see that they are most of the time they are cold because there is no circulation there is no enough blood and when you are trying to see the tongue analysis for those people you will see that tongues are also are usually not pinkish they are usually whitish in color or sometimes if there is stagnation you will see the blue patches on their tongues as well now that blood also provides the color and the complexion to your overall body and is the spirit of our life so without blood circulating properly inside the system or inside our bodies we cannot live that's the the whole life depending of it depends upon how good your overall blood is now hypertension as we mentioned it's a disorder of rakta dhatu it's the is the problem when it come, comes towards the rakta dhatu and usually it's a problem with the rakta vata or the imbalance of vata how is that it's we all know the just like vata has five different uh, different types same way pitta has five different types and kapha has five different types so out of that ranjaka pitta which is the one number one sub type of pitta in rakta dhatu that gets affected due to when somebody is eating the wrong food when i say wrong food that means they are making the choice of very spicy food very oily food eating late night eating very salty food or alcohol consumption is excessive when there is a lot of sun exposure uh, when there is always an anger inside when there is a hatred inside when the mind is not satvik when its my mind is not pure we have seen uh, uh, we always hear vikram dada sessions as well where he talks about the satva the satva is the purity or the, the good thoughts which we we are important so food is the first thing which decide what you think if you are not having a good food whatever whatever type of food which is needed for the satvic lifestyle no matter what you do the changes are not going to happen so the wrong food choices makes everything difficult when it go when it go to the when you start start moving towards the further stages of life the excessive increase of rakta dhatu that actually affects the vata in the rakta dhatu to get logged how is that what do you mean by that so imagine there is um you are actually traveling in the train if you have ever been to bombay or anybody is from bombay when i was i was in a college when i was traveling to university usually we have to catch the train at 9 o'clock in the morning for to attend the first lecture at 11 so labs or whatever lecture we have or even everybody whoever has traveled into the you know the the trains which are which are like packed with people there are doors open there are windows open but just imagine there is a box of 10 to 12 the the, the 10 by 12 box and there are 50 people who are packed inside that box and <clears throat> there are only two windows just like i was explaining about the train there are two windows on the train and there are 50 people blocked inside and there is there are these are the only two windows have the capacity to blow air when there is a packed people inside when there is so much rush or so much crowd inside none of you or none of the person who is standing inside is going to get enough air 
that's one will be there is won't be a circulation inside of the air no matter what but when you start distributing or when the, those people get out of the train when their train stations come so if there are only 10 10 people remaining then those two windows when the air blows in it actually circulates really well inside so it's exactly like that when there is an increasing of rakta dhatu that means you are you have an excessive cells which we call it as the uh, density or the stickiness of the blood as well because there are too many cells inside the red cells inside so when there is an increase of rakta dhatu the of actually vata which is like movement there is no stop it just moves inside and that's like a major controller of our body that's one of the like highest dosha we call it as the vata is sluggish <coughs> because it doesn't have space to go in so it stopped at one place so that is the main cause of hypertension explained in uh, ayurveda which is the disorder of rakta dhatu or which is a rakta vata we call it as <coughs> now let's move to the give me one second okay now let's move to the modern nutrition perspective of the hypertension. Uh, in the modern nutrition, usually the risk for the heart attack and the stroke is the highest when a person is at the um, yeah, at the border of the hypertension or here where the person is leading towards the hypertension. The borderline or the moderate numbers are usually can be brought under control. So anybody who is in the range of 130, 140, sometimes even 150 can be brought under control with the proper diet and lifestyle changes. Usually, or I would say 100% of the time, the vegetarian lifestyle is one of the most recommended when it comes to the controlling of hypertension. That involves lots of green vegetables. There are lots of fruits. Uh, there are specific types of uh, remedies and herbs which are being added as well. The one, Another thing which we have all have to watch for is the potassium and sodium ratio. Then there are relaxation techniques. Meditation and yoga plays a big, big, big role when it comes to the uh, controlling of hypertension. Then intake of vitamin C. Why? Because we need to control our oxidative stress or the oxidation inside and then repair of the CoQ10 uh, deficiency. And we will talk about that as well. Why there is the CoQ10 deficiency seen in most of the people who are more towards the or they are, who are leading towards the hypertension. Now, this is a quick area we are going to cover, not going much in detail, but it's called PMS or it is called the, it's a mineral team of potassium, magnesium and sodium. Now, potassium is the min important mineral. Uh, it's an electrolyte in the water distribution, important for the heart and muscle functions, kidneys and adrenal functions. It's very, very important to uh, maintain the proper levels of potassium or rather the uh, good levels of potassium to maintain the blood pressure. Now, remember when there is a, a problem of underlying problem of a chronic kidney disease, it's a different story because uh, in those, those, uh, those patients or those individuals, they don't have the capacity to remove that excess potassium from their bodies. And there sometimes their drugs which are there put on, they actually are potassium sparing drugs. That means uh, the, the, the drugs actually do not take the potassium out of our body. They retain the potassium there. So that's the other exception. You have to talk to your physician about how to maintain that. But in general, potassium is helpful for controlling the uh, blood pressure commonly. Magnesium is another related energy production heart muscles uh, for the rhythmic activity, then central role in, in uh, producing the energy producing reactions and vasodilation is one of the other major reasons why magnesium is uh, rather recommended in the food form as well as in the uh, supplemental form for the for people who are uh, uh, or rather diagnosed, diagnosed with the borderline or the hypertensions as well. Now, sodium is another thing. Remember now, potassium and sodium, these are all intracellular minerals. The, that means they are inside the cells mainly. The sodium is mainly the outside, outside the cells, or outside the environment over there. So it's again, essential minerals for muscles and nerve function. The, it, the brain cannot function well if your sodium level is low. So people who are actually more towards the depressions or people who are constantly fatigued, sometimes their sodium levels are low their water balance is off. So usually the uh, people who are, again, the, with the kidney disease, they have to be a little bit careful because uh, so sodium has uh, the capacity to retain water. So that's another, another category. We are not going to touch those, those topics today. Then usually what should be the potassium and sodium ratio, which is helpful in the hypertension, what has been seen now commonly in our diet, 
It is commonly seen ratio in the population in general is one is to two. That means your potassium is lower than your sodium. It has been seen one is to two when it is supposed to be, or the recommended ratio should be five is to one. So your potassium level should be higher, five times higher than your sodium level for the maintenance. Now that can be achieved by adding a lot of fresh vegetables, fresh fruits in daily diets that may fulfill the ratio over just eating the meat and poultry. So meat and poultry consumption is commonly seen uh, and not having enough food and vegetables is one of the common problems. And as we mentioned, the CKD, that means the chronic kidney disease patients have a different, a different approach of controlling it. Their potassium levels are actually higher. So they needs to be, that needs to be monitored with, by the help of a dietitian and the doctors. Now, magnesium intake, how much the body should be consuming the magnesium overall. And again, I'm talking for the general purpose, the general people only or the general category only. I'm not touching anybody who has uh, the, the uh, common issues with the chronic kidney diseases. So based, usually the, it's a six milligram over 2.2 pounds or over one kg. So one kg should be consuming six milligrams of magnesium overall. And along with the dietary intake, sometimes it's not fulfilled. Uh, so if, say, say, for example, you are 53 kgs, you are, you are 54 kgs, so you should be consuming 54 multiplied by six times of the magnesium. And that is not usually fulfilled by the diet because of the reasons for the soil quality, because of the overall planning of the meal is, you're not getting the full nutrition that, that way because of your lifestyle choice. Then the other part, which has been commonly given, is the, uh, the when the lifestyle changes are done to initially to uh, boost up the, the levels, the uh, supplementation support is recommended. And the recommended forms are usually the ones with the amino acids, which is the chelated forms, which will get absorbed better into your guts because minerals usually when they are not having an attachment of amino acids or they are not attached to the amino acids, they have a capacity to sit into your colon, colon for the long, longer period of time and they can upset the, upset the stomach or form the loose stools or you can have a diarrhea if it is a small, uh, if they are just not chelated and sitting in your stomach for long. That's why the amino acids, which is a chelated form, which has been um, usually recommended to get the better absorption. Now, oral forms, there are some, uh, uh, some, you know, some physicians, they prefer to have a magnesium into the, through the IVs as well. But the best form, of course, there are some particular cases probably, that's why they are recommending it. But oral form is the best for the absorption when it comes to the magnesium. Now, there are top 10 foods for providing the highest magnesium sources per 100 grams. And these are all vegetarian choices. So these are all, the main, the highest one is the kelp, which is a seaweed. The almonds, cashews, buckwheat, Brazil nut, millet, pecan, walnuts, tofu, dry coconut. If you have seen uh, uh, Vikram Tada's plate, if you have ever, whoever is following Sattva diet also, they must have, you must have seen that they are all having the, uh, the lots of uh, vegetables and mainly seeds and nuts in their, on their plate, along with the other, other foods which they eat. So that is the, the best way of consuming the, the magnesium with the help of food. Now there are top five foods which are ideal with the potassium sodium ratio. There are many other foods also, but there are, these are the first top, top fives which can give you the most ideal ratio for the potassium to sodium. Apples are the best, 90 to one. Then bananas, great choice again. The carrots, the oranges and the potatoes. So, so these are the ones which are the good top five ratios, which are we usually show the potassium to sodium ratios, the ideal potassium to sodium ratios. Now, and remember the way you cook those vegetables also, if you are cooking the vegetables, it's also important how much of an oil you're using, what type of oil you're using, for how long you're cooking. So all that matters, whatever I gave you, or whatever numbers you were seeing, that is the raw category. Now, nutrition therapy, what is recommended uh, with the, for the lifestyle and the diet, is usually to include the whole grains, vegetable, nuts, seeds, fruits, and of course, enough fiber. Fiber, 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 fiber. Fiber is very important to keep your elimination going, to keep your unwanted, uh, so to, to actually lower down your cholesterol, to actually, you know, the sequence the cholesterol from your system. It's very important to have fiber added along with your proteins. It's And fiber is, I mean, it's not consumed the way it is the people are supposed to be consuming it. So that is a very important part. Avoid processed food and trans fat. We all know about this. 
routine checkups, especially after 50, you cannot push your annual checkups. Like that's okay, let's do it after two years, after three years, it's not like that. You have to be regular on your checkups and especially women should focus on uh, their health, uh, especially their cardiac health when it comes to the menopausal, after the menopausal lives or years, because remember that these are all hormones. Cholesterol is also a type of hormone and you're dealing when there are the hormone imbalances going on inside, a lot of things changes. It leads more towards the cardiac issues, your bone issues, all of those. Uh, so you have to be really precautious about those things. Regular exercising, whichever way, if you're doing, the conduct, uh, you're, you're, have adopted yoga in your uh, lifestyle, great. Be regular in those exercises. Having a partner with those exercises is very, very uh, useful or other works better. Then control consumption of alcohol, refined sugar. People are going to hate me for that, I know. I'll get a lot of, uh, you know, what is she talking about, those things, but I don't care. This is the thing which is important. We all have to face uh, or rather pay back. If we don't take a control now, then keep your body hydrated. That is also very important because people don't eat uh, much water, especially during the winter time also. So make sure that you are hydrated, you are keeping your bodies hydrated. Avoid any excessive salt, salty or preserved foods. I'll, I'll give you a good example of the preserved food. If you have ever, ever seen um, the, what is the, a panera. Panera is a mac and cheese. It actually contains 2200 milligrams of uh, salt in that one serving of magnesium. That, sorry, one serving of salt, the sodium. So that is equal to approximately, we need approximately 2300 to 2400 over a, for a, for over, all over, like a, throughout the day. Or like one day, the consumption should be max 2300 to 2400. One serving of that uh, mac and cheese from from the store, which I just mentioned, it's giving you the 2200, uh, the, providing that that number already. So imagine if that is one one of your meals. What are what is the rest of your meal? What are you going to eat? That is already fulfilled. So be careful about whenever you are checking the labels at the back when you are uh, grabbing a, a soup can. For especially for it's nothing wrong to having one or two things uh, like having preserved foods for the cans, but always watch the label. There are multiple options of low sodium as well or no salt added as well. So look for those labels and see which is the better choice. Now, when it comes to the supplemental recommendation for keeping your, if you are not getting enough nutrition from your food or if you are having any underlying causes or problems overall, you are on the medications then the high potency multivitamin magnesium uh, which is needed coenzyme q10 which is also a uh, which is some something which is one of the reservoirs basically for our uh, cells flaxseed oil great in the combination of omega 3s and 6 even just the flax seed not crushing it but just the raw flax seeds in the form of supari or the mouth freshener afterwards is helpful and vitamin c in either food form or you can take it into a supplemental form now we were talking about why coenzyme Q10. So the reason for that, uh, we all know it's in the reservoirs of mitochondria. And whoever is on the statin drugs, who is taking statin drugs for the heart health, uh, they should be always be taking coenzyme along with it because it blocks the path of the coenzyme production. So coenzyme Q10 along with vitamin D is always recommended when somebody is on the statin drugs or usually in any of the hy hypertensive drugs or statin drugs pro. Um, same amount is basically synthesized in, uh, it normally synthesizes in our in system overall, but because of certain health issues like hypertension, it is compromised. It's not producing in the same amount what is needed actually for the proper functioning. And then capacity of the, of the strong antioxidation gets depleted because we are not having enough coenzyme Q10 produced and the, the free radical production increases. That free radical is one of the causes for be building up the plaque further in your arteries. So that can cause the further damage. So small amount of foods uh, like soy, walnuts, green beans, spinach, cabbage, and garlic, they do provide the coenzyme Q10. That's another reason why garlic is highly recommended also in um, Ayurveda for, uh, for the heart health, overall heart health. And even also in the traditional Chinese medicine and also in the Western medicines or Western herbalism. Now there are some additional nutrients you can strike for the stroke preventions because stroke is the uh, another cause going towards when you have a hypertension. So taking B complex either in the 
supplemental form or the B-complex group of foods. If you are thinking you're not eating enough B-complex type of category food, then you can take a, a small dose of B-complex maybe once or twice in a week. And then helps that actually helps in the reduction of the amino acid homo homocysteine, which gives you that inflammation uh, issues. Then vitamin E, which is a great all antioxidant and can be combined along with CoQ10. And the, the good source for the vitamin E is nuts, seeds, and whole grains. Selenium is another one, which has essential trace mineral for antioxidant protection, uh, also for the immunity modulation and uh, very, very, very helpful for the people who have thyroid, uh, thyroid problems, especially if somebody is on uh, having a hypothyroidism issue and having uh, uh, the Hashimoto has been detected if they have a very high antibodies, then selenium is usually recommended to uh, for in their, in their protocols. Now, the a good source of selenium is Brazil nuts, Oats also has good amount of selenium, but Brazil nuts is number one. Now, when it comes to the holistic dietary and lifestyle recommendations, always control the obesity by doing the regular exercises and fasting. Fasting should be done under the proper guidance and supervision because there are ways of fasting. There are rules of fasting, who should, who should not, and how, how the fasting should be or rather should proceed further. So always should be under the proper guidance of that. Fasting at least once a week is a once a week is a good startup. At least get start getting your body your body ready for it. Low salt, low salt and low fat diet. Consume always or try to at least consume homemade cooked food at least three to four times in a week. Include raw and boiled vegetables with the meals. Of course, no smoking and no drinking. And add garlic in regular cooking. There's a beautiful study I found on um, uh, NIH website for the study of combining garlic along with the lemon juice mixture for the heart health. So whenever you get time, you can, these slides are shared, so you can just click on the article and uh, read the article uh, for your reference. Now, there are some beautiful home remedies which are being uh, also given in Ayurveda. And uh, generally, these are mainly from Ayurveda and TCM, and also there are some from Western herbalism. So a few, and there are many actually, I have not mentioned anything, not much or not all because we are running out of time, but uh, there are lots of different ways you can do. These are some quick ones, which you can, you can do it at home. So for the daily use, one teaspoon of onion juice with honey before the meals. Now, onions is, uh, it's, it's a basically a real relative of asparagus, which we eat. And it's a, it has a strong presence of sulfur compound and uh, basically in, in the base of the onion. So it's more warming, it's circulatory. So it's, it's basically pushing your vata inside which is that sluggish water, it actually triggers it and makes sure that it's actually moving inside. It's anti-inflammatory, very, very high in bioflavonoid quercetin. So people who have the allergic issues, uh, they are uh, recommended to take the quercetin either in the supplemental form or when you're looking at the food categories, the onion has the highest quercetin in there. Um, and uh, uh, one interesting fact about the quercetin from the onion, is a raw onion actually has less quercetin in comparison to the uh, fried onions. When you are actually frying them, brick, br making them brown, that actually has more quercetin in it. And it is helpful in balancing kapha and pitta together. So that's why the uh, this is one of the home remedies which has been used to control the blood pressure. Then dragon fruit, and this is something I personally use every day in my smoothies. I use it for a different reason, but this is something I use every day. So this is, a, this is traditionally uh, used for constipation or for the lung congestions also, and excellent for the people who have endocrine issues like diabetes. It's rich in vitamin C, and you should always choose the ones which has red skinned. There are two different skin varieties, but the red skin variety is especially good for this, uh, this reason, and it contains the phytoalbumin, which is one of the antioxidants. Uh, so usually you use about two tablespoons of a pulp every day in smoothies, or you can just scoop it like that. It is basically tasteless. If you are if you are eating kiwi, it's exactly taste uh, tastes like that. It's more like a watery taste, but not a specific taste as such. It's, it's very close to the kiwi category. Now the interesting one, another the fennel seeds. We have used always fennel seeds for the as a digestive aid, but that digestive aid. Remember, if your digestion is weak. You are, whatever you are eating, if it, it's sitting up there, it's actually obstructing the Apanavayu, which is supposed to be moving that uh, uh, the unwanted you know, waste out of your system and that's clogging the whole system again. So it's important to keep your digestive system strong enough 
when you are actually suffering from the hypertension as well. So and it contains the, um, the volatile oil antho and it's helpful not only in the in digestion, but also for the gas and hypertension. Again, there is an article which has been studied here uh, on the use of uh, fennel seeds in uh, when it comes to the hypertension as well. You can make a fennel tea or just sip, sip that fennel tea after the, after the meal, or you can actually chew the combination of fennel seeds along with ajwain and the flax seeds together. You can roast them a little bit and chew it after, the, after your meal. Now, the, the, another one is the cinnamon for circulation, which is commonly used for as a warming culinary spice. This is also something I use every day when I'm making my first thing morning tea. Uh, so I use about one tablespoon of cinnamon before I boil that, before I'm actually uh, using the chai pati in it. So that's a powerful stimulatory herb, which enhances the peripheral circulation, which is also one of the other factor when it, when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the hypertension as well. It can be used in tea or capsules as well. If you are, if you don't like the tea taste, you can also use them in a capsule form. Now there are some quick Ayurveda remedies we are going to look at. It's the garlic with draksha. Draksha is the those, um, uh, the grapes which we call it as the it's a red or the uh, the black grapes. So approximately one gram of each garlic and the and the draksha is been combined in one cup of milk with approximately three cups of water and you have, you have to reduce down to one cup and take half cup in the morning and half cup in the evening approximately for a month. Uh, garlic is vata hari, it actually controls vata and draksha is a pitta hari, so it controls the pitta. And this is another remedy which we are commonly, uh, again, there are so many, hawthorn berry, there are so many, so many different remedies. This is the common one. Sarpagandha and, and Arjuna combination there are uh, multiple tablets which come in the combination, or you can take two different ones at the same time. They are very synergistic to each other. Arjuna is more like a heart tonic, can be taken for people who are not just for the hypertension and also for people who are uh, uh, who wants to have a good heart overall, like a good rhythmic, uh, you know, pumping overall. So Arjuna is great. Uh, Sarpaganda is uh, it's specifically specifically given for the high blood pressure also. So it's the combination together works really well. And Normact formula, this is another very, very commonly prescribed formulation by Indian doctors, the Ayurvedic doctors. Uh, that they, this, is the, this is the combination which this one has. Uh, Lasuna, Arjuna, Siguru. This is a very, very common formula, which you will find it in. Uh, I personally like this formulation a lot. So this is one of the other ones. Now, Ayurveda recommendations for the diet, diet and lifestyle, low fat, low salt. Of course, we all know that. Consumption of bitter guard and drumsticks, boiled vegetables and fruits. So bitter guard is excellent. Drumsticks, we all know it's very tasty vegetable. You can have that limited quantity of cow's milk and butter, butter and ghee, very limited quantity, not like uh, you, you won't go overboard and don't stop also. Then avoid high carbohydrate diet. Natural urges, some people have uh, the tendency of Oh, I'm, I'm feeling actually to use, go to the bathroom, but that's okay. I can go after some time. Do not do that because you are suppressing the natural urges and actually go, going against the elements which are controlling your bodies. Then 30 to 60 minute walks in the morning and evening in the fresh air. If you cannot do it right now in your in the winter season, you can always walk inside the, inside the home or uh, maybe on the trade meal or just make small circulations after or rather maybe small 100, 100 step walks after your meals. These are some uh, topical therapies which they do. Spinal bath is very, very commonly done. Uh, lots of Ayurvedic or naturopathic uh, clinics um, in India, they have the spinal bath, which uh, actually provides, or the vata which is obstructed there, they put a hot bath and the circulation is done only on the, the hotter water hot circulation is done only at the spine. Then this is a deep relaxation in Shavasana for 20 minutes, twice daily. This is one of the most important and very, very highly recommended uh, exercise uh, done for uh, hypertension or controlling hypertension. This is our uh, Shri Kaka who is performing this and he sent me this. Uh, I was asking him about the videos so or the photos and he sent me one immediately. And of course, we cannot forget our daily keep fit yoga routine. Whoever has are been performing the yogas, on the regular basis. First thing always starts with the joint movements of your hands on your feet. It's a warming exercise. 
then all uh, there are about 14 or 15 core postures. Whoever can do that, not everybody is uh, capable of doing all the core postures, but whoever can do it, whatever up to their capacities. And lastly, the breathing exercises which everybody can perform. And that mainly uh, the ones which are important or rather helpful or beneficial for the cardiac health is Agnisar, Kapalbhati, Bhaiya Kumbhak and Pranayam. So those are the fours which are which are always get uh, done in the morning at eight o'clock by Sabniskaka. So uh, if you're not attending this class, it's important, especially if you are in the category of hypertension to at least perform the breathing exercises with the class. So that brings to the end of our presentation. Uh, this is just my information on my email and uh, our website. And I hope that it's not too much overall. <laughs> I know I've, I've uh, I think went about six minutes about time. <laughs> and there is a complete silence. <laughs> now you covered a lot. <laughs> uh, there is a lot to digest. <laughs> That's, That's why I think he has recorded it. He Hello, Alka. But okay. uh, he covered a lot, lot. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, yeah. Good job as usual. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Hello, Alka. This is a very informative, very good talk. Um, I can see so much of correlation between Oriental medicine and uh, Ayurveda course, yeah. and even the Western medicine. Uh, and our old, actually in Chinese medicine, we say hypertension is a modern disease because they never had hypertension in olden days because they lived with the nature. They had a lot of exercise. And when the sun was down, they slept. The winter and summer, they had life adjustment. So they did not have a hypertension. Now with that modern stressful condition, Everybody gets hypertension, even if you breathe. So absolutely, absolutely, I totally agree with you. And the food wise, in olden days, people didn't go to a restaurant and eat; they ate at home. And even if somebody comes, they offer just buttermilk or some soothing fluid, not coffee and alcohol and things like that. So hypertension was not there. Now is a modern disease we have. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Because we are going against the, the forces which against we are the supposed to. And fasting is one thing we do. Ekadashi and every day has yeah. some holy it's thing. It's not just fasting. the religious way. There was a scientific and there was a yeah. benefit reasons behind it. Yes. Is there any connection with the menopause and the hypertension? Absolutely there is. Absolutely, oh. because remember when during the menopause, you are you we actually change with our hormonal therapy. Overall, hormonal uh, you know imbalance is going on. We are changing so many things inside our hormones, and that does affect the heart health as well. So, women who are actually post menopausal and who are going towards the menopausal, they should be very very precautious about taking care of this. Uh, you know, especially the cardiac health, uh, the hypertension, and overall uh, overall heart health. Yeah, and that's what happened. And once you start that medicine, you know, you cannot stop the medicine. It's very hard to come That's a very problem. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Main problem, you know, you cannot just stop that. You can reduce it, but you cannot stop for everybody. Yeah, that, and that's another reason why there are some physicians. I would say a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, old school physicians, they uh -huh. don't immediately ask you to start the medication until they give you a certain amount of time, yes. say, for example, six months, seven months. Right. The first thing they ask you is to, is to change your lifestyle. Go change those, do some exercises. And then if still it is not getting under control, then they check you for the secondary causes to see if there is any kidney problems going on, any other issues going on. And only then they put you on the medications. So yeah. that's how the that's how those old school physicians are. But the new ones, they I think unfortunately everything just goes on the meds. No, not in a new case too. In my case, they just started, you know, to be Yeah. And uh, I stuck on that medicine. Yeah, yeah but, but once your is, body gets used to certain things, it's very, yeah. very hard to come back out of it. Yeah, it is controlled by the medicine, but I cannot stop it. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hegdeshi, you have a question? 
अलकाजी खूप खूप धन्यवाद बरीच माहिती दिली द क्वेश्चन दॅट आय हॅड वॉज आय डोंट नो इफ आय वॉज इन हायपर टेन्शन रेंज बट करंटली माय ब्लड प्रेशर फॉर सम टाइम हॅज बीन द हायेस्ट सिस्टॉलिक हॅज बीन आय थिंक एटी टू ऑर एटी फायव्ह and as to it has been between 135 and 140 so some time ago my uh, um health provider put me on um uh, blood pressure medicine uh, and uh, a few months ago i was in india and i started on ayurvedic uh, uh, pills whatever the doctor provided now like uh, the blood pressure medicine they say once you start taking it you have to continue taking it is that the fact number 1 and if i am out on ayurvedic medicine do i have to continue to take that throughout the life too or is there a time when i could stop taking those medicines so with ayurvedic medicines uh, and along with the conventional medicines also there is a very high chance that your your blood pressure can go uh, the lower than what is been like right so you always should be in contact with your physicians to make sure that you are watching first of all you should not be mixing the medications at all especially both the medications together because no, if that, that is... happens you can actually fall into a category whether it is it is actually dangerous to your health no that is correct i am glad you said that and that is a confirmation of what my ayurvedic doctor told me uh, yeah. he said that you first start taking your um, blood pressure medicine not every day like you have been exactly. taking, like i was suggesting but stagger it you know first start it uh, two days after and then three days and that uh but now i can stop it i guess because i am already on ayurvedic drug and i think it is helping me because i keep monitoring my blood pressure uh, regularly but no, to... what you are telling me is i can stop no. taking either no. of the medications i don't have to continue to take no. it So that decision it has to come from your doctor. Yes, yeah, I understand. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. One addition is that it's a smart thing to have the blood pressure instrument in your home. There are so many uh, blood pressure instruments so keep uh, con- you know keep a reading of the blood pressure that way you, you can see what is going on it is be useful for you to tell the doctor. what is your reading then he can act on it yes thank you sir yeah and make sure that the you know, the best time to take your blood, blood pressure uh, or other the ideal numbers which you are going to get for your blood pressure is in the morning when you get up uh, maybe or not immediately when you get up because your cortisol levels will be high if you suddenly get up but after that maybe once you come down for your tea or uh, you know you are sitting and relaxing to actually sitting for some time right after you uh, right after you wake up that's the time you can take blood pressure and then sometimes in the evening also so you take two different readings and see where you stand because if you take something in the middle then it may be different thank you so much bela you uh, you have a question i yeah, i am on the i went to see a sleep doctor at hopkins and he said my circadian clock is at the west coast time so that's why when ever we sleeping at 10 o'clock i sleep at 1 o'clock yeah so is this something i can change is this something i can change i told my husband let's move to california <laughs> you know what for that and you are absolutely right because if right now if your circadian rhythm is 3 hours shift so slowly you start putting yourself don't do anything abruptly If you try to force yourself to sleep at nine o'clock this time, you will never sleep. Yeah. So slowly, you say for example, your uh, sleeping time is nine p.m. here, so nine p.m. California time and twelve p.m. here. You slowly start reducing down. Start with eleven first. Maybe I would say eleven thirty first. Then slowly push it back to to eleven, ten thirty, ten, maybe ten o'clock. So that you should never ever do anything abruptly. because if you do that you are going to fail for sure so my 2024 goal is instead of 1 o'clock i started sleeping by 12 midnight exactly. i moved it up to 1 hour it's 12:30 dheere dheere le take it easy for <laughs> half an hour half an hour yeah just try to push yourself 30 minutes before never do it anything 
I have to sleep 10. You will never sleep by 10 o'clock. So yeah. if this is not going to happen, why do you even force yourself to do that? So is it okay? It's like slowly, slowly. Yeah, I mean, this this is how, yeah, slowly you build oh, up the habit. The you never the, you ever built up the habit immediately of anything. And of This is just the sleep, but of ever any general habit, you will never build up fast. Like never have built up abruptly. Right. And I get up late because I'm retired. So that I don't have to get up 5.30 anymore. And I never get up in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's a good thing. So that means you just have to adjust your rhythm. Maybe if you are taking a nap in the afternoon, cut it down. No, I don't take nap. no, I don't take any nap. That's fine. And maybe you just need five hours of good sleep. If no, that no, is I do sleep eight, nine yeah. hours. I like my sleep one o'clock, I get up <laughs> nine, nine thirty. No, but that's a wrong way of sleeping because over here the sun is already up there. So you should not be in the bed when the sun is after six o'clock. Normally you shouldn't be. Okay. So slowly I will do it. So Thank you so much. So don't do anything abruptly. Okay. Thank you. What is the right time, ideal time to take a medicine? That that again, you should talk to your doctor because there are those so many different types. There mm -hmm. are different types to be taken at the different times also. So that comes from your physician. Okay. Thank you. Alka, I have some question. I posted it on the chat. Oh, okay. Come by a second. Uh... Why don't you ask me <laughs> based on the stroke volume, which is the best position sitting, standing or laying down a retired person should spend during the day. I would never recommend to go for the laying down. Sitting is okay. Sitting down is not a bad idea at all. You are just pushing a little bit towards, uh, you know, uh, doing some minor activities, but laying down is not recommended. Uh, Unhealthy sleep pattern, what's your advice for folks who are night hours? Physiologically means they are much active, creative in the night than daytime. They need to be, as I said, they need to be start putting themselves in a more forceful mode of start with anything which makes you feel first. I think I have, we have, and I'm glad you said it because we do have clients and patients like that. They are, they cannot just sleep. So one of the common reasons which we are seeing nowadays is the phone. They always have the electronic devices with them, no matter what time of the uh, the day it is, especially at night, because everybody is sleeping. That's the most active time for lots of seniors to start texting. So that needs to be stopped. Any electronic devices and use uh, maybe, a, you know, the blue light in your uh, in your rooms, especially like a small blue light and make sure your every all other lights are off. There is nothing on. Automatically, you will be, once you lie down, you slowly, it will be one day, two day, three days, four days. After that, your body will give up and just like, okay, I'm going to sleep. So that's another way of doing it. The other thing I heard was uh, uh, the uh, connection between melatonin and uh, uh, computers because yep. it will decrease your melatonin level. That's why you're more awake. So you have to put off your computer. Maybe yeah, no, from actually there are two hours before you go to bed there should not be any electronics yes absolutely no electronics how much water should a senior drink not senior as per uh, i mean seniors have so many other requirements as meant but overall the thumb rule is whatever is your body weight you divide that by half and that much is the water suggestions now if somebody has any underlying issues especially if they have water retention problems or they should they are advised to drink less so that depends of their depends upon their conditions, but overall, it's a half of your body weight. Half of in ounces. Half of your body weight. So, for example, you are one twenty pounds. So you divide one twenty by two, which is sixty ounces. So sixty ounces should be your uh, uh, minimum, or rather, the, your intake of water throughout the day. Does too much water dilate up uh, uh, brings your sodium level down? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. In some of the conditions, yeah, it can. So you have to, you have, there are some underlying conditions which you have to watch how much water you are drinking. So you just have to consult your doctor if this is something it is okay or you want me to drink less water overall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there are any more. Are, are there any more questions? One quick question. Now, yeah. when you look at magnesium, 
you have the anionic portion is concerned, you have wide varieties, right? Yeah. Succinate or right, glycinate. Any particular preference for one or the other? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question again. So there are particular groups which are needed for muscular health. There are particular group needed for the constipations. So give you an example for person who are very, very, very highly constipated. The, uh, the, you know, the last choice is given is magnesium oxide and which is one of the cheapest forms because that, that actually uh, holds a lot of water to make the stool softer. But overall, if a person is not uh, like a severely constipated, but uh, they are more prone more towards taking the magnesium and then citrate mallet is good. Glycinate is good. Taking glycinate in the high doses. Like uh, uh, you can go up to, body can handle up to 1200 milligrams easily. So you can start maybe starting from 400 to 500 milligrams to go with, go for. And then slowly uh, you will start building up the, you know, having proper bowel movements as well. Hello, I have a question. Yeah, once again, a phenomenal presentation. I just love Thank listening you. to your presentation. That's super. Hello. Hello. Hello, Alka. Wonderful presentation, like very informative. Thank I have you. a question in general and in specific regarding magnesium. Mm -hmm. So as a woman in like above 45, you're supposed to take multiple vitamins. Like I'm... I was like, let's say you have vitamin D deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you're supposed to take calcium after 45, suppose. Is, how do you pace? Like, I feel like it's hard. And also fish oil, you know, for yeah. omega threes. So I find it hard. Like, is it okay to consume all your multivitamins at night after dinner, just before dinner or something like that? Or should we... Uh, space them like lunchtime something and if we do then do we have a particular thing that you should consume at night because you your stomach gets a lot of rest so that's question one the question two I have is um, is that a test you can do to check if you are magnesium deficient like with the Indian diet the proper Indian production is typically one should not be magnesium deficient because you are consuming koshimbir which is basically raw and spinach and garlic so is there a test one can do to okay yeah to... so the, to answer your first question first of, all, call... yeah, first of all make sure that you can get most of your nutrients from the food that's your first source because supplements are not the food. Supplement is something which is giving you the supportive element towards your food. Like when you are deficient in certain things, and unfortunately, as I said, it's a soil quality also, environmental things which are affecting the food quality. So there are little holes which gets created after still we eat a nutritious food or still we eat or consume a good amount of vegetables or good amount of diet. So there are still some holes which needs to be filled, especially when we are aging. So to answer your first question, the first thing which all, all of us should or rather can take is the very good quality multivitamin. When you are taking a multivitamin, never ever take the multivitamin at once. Like when you see one a day uh, or, and I'm again, I'm not against any companies, don't take me wrong. Uh, so it, but the way it gets absorbed into your system, it should always be taken into the multiple doses. Like it should be taken in the divided dose. It should not be taken at once. So usually the practitioner brands, if you see, they will always give you consume two or three capsules in a day. So you should be doing one, one, and one, or either one and one. So to begin with the multivitamin, if you're deficient in certain things, you, you can consume it like there are uh, fat soluble and there are water soluble. So water soluble, unfortunately, if you are deficient, you have to take every day to make sure that you are actually saturating enough. And the fat soluble, you can actually uh, saturate and then stop for a certain time like vitamin D and take it back again when you are deficient for, for whatever reason. So you can take vitamin D besides the multivitamin if it is needed to uh, fulfill your specific need. You can, uh, you can just saturate yourself with that and then stop for some time. Then uh, the multivitamin where you're taking into divided doses, if you're on the top of that taking B complex, then B complex should not be taken at night time because it's energized. So, I mean, energizing overalls because it provides the energy. 
uh, to your body. So B complex, if you're taking, should be taken in the morning, not at night. Vitamin D, yes, you can take it any time of the day, it is fine. Just consume it with the fat base. Uh, it is usually given in the fat base. If, we put, if you can consume in the fat base, it's better absorbed. Uh, or even uh, there is a combination of D3 plus K2 now, <clears throat> which is actually helpful for the consumption. So you can take it that way. If you're taking CoQ10, as we have mentioned, the CoQ10 should never be taken empty stomach because that can cause the uh, stomach issues, like that can cause a little bit of diarrhea for a person. So always should be taken in the morning time and should be taken with the food. So these are the general things. Now, when you're talking about the magnesium test, there are tests which are for the magnesium. But remember, magnesium is extremely essential for our vital organs. So the blood magnesium, which or the, 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 the plasma concentration, which you are going to see, that always will be intact. You will never see the plasma levels going down unless you are severely, severely deficient. So you should be always looking into the cellular magnesium because most of the potassium and magnesium is stored inside your cells. And there is actually a test for the cellular magnesium as well, but that's a little bit expensive testing. So if you go into the lab corp or if you go in the um, uh, quest, walk-in labs actually does have that magnesium intracellular testing as well. So there is a test available to see what your magnesium levels are uh, internally in the cells. Great. Thank you. Um, but I, I to, to go back to answer the previous one, I was, I did turn out to be oversaturated in B12. Looks like they told me to take B12 because I was deficient. And when I went next year, they're like, stop taking it because you're having too much. Of yeah, I know that's, that's something you will, all, and this is a question which we normally see in, with our, uh, uh, whoever, whoever patients and clients we see. So remember B12 is a water soluble. So even though you are, it's in the higher in number, it's going to flush out your system is unless you have any impaired things going inside, but it's going to flush out through your system. So once it gets saturated, then you don't have to take the B12 regularly, like every day. You can just take it maybe once or twice a week. That is more than enough. Then if it comes to a point again, when if it is dropping, then you can start back again. But I would say when it comes to a point when you are saturated, then make sure that you are, unfortunately, if you're vegetarian for us, there is no other way then taking the supplementation because it's very, very hard to get our B12 from the vegetarian sources. So if you are constantly deficient, always check your iron levels as well, because sometimes if your B12 is not boosting, one of the other common causes is the iron as well. And if your stomach acid is not proper, if you are if you have a hypochohedria, then that's another reason why your B12 and iron both are not boosting, so which is also another common problem. But that, that means then you have to go back to the lab in like a quarter, yeah. or three months or four months. and then check. Every four months. Yeah, that's not a bad thing to check. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the C is uh, COQ10, that's indicated only for high BPs or that's not a regular multi? No, no. It's mainly for people who have hypertension or any cardiac problems going on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if you have leg cramps at night, Mm -hmm. uh, what they call Charlie horse. Mm -hmm. uh, is that due to magnesium deficiency? Yeah, there is one one of the magnesium deficiencies and also the B complex, like any B12 deficiency as well. And magnesium deficiency can be if you uh, eat uh, specific uh, foods that you said that are rich in magnesium, that can help? Yeah, the, they, those foods will provide you, but they will not provide you the the 100% uh, you know the requirement which is needed to actually see the therapeutic effect and that's so why the supplementations is needed. are yeah the supplementations are usually recommended in those cases and that you recommend gelatin uh, uh, magnesium yeah all the chelated ones so okay. like magnesium uh, glycinate glycinate has less distress on uh, your stomach that's the least uh, you know let uh, stool softening uh, thing. Glycinate, citrate mallet is okay. There are uh, magnesium, gluconate is available, mallet is available. So any of those are fine. Thank you. I Hello. think that was it, Kappa. I don't think there are any questions. Uh, I think Shaila has one a question. Question, huh? question, a request. Huh? Uh, excellent presentation, Alka. Oh, uh, you, is the recording available? Yes, uh, it will be available. Uh, Kashavarati? Uh, uh, are you on Sri Yoga? 
काय श्रीयोगावरती आहेस का तू हो आहे ओके मग श्रीयोगावरती आय विल बी पोस्टिंग द रेकॉर्डिंग ओके थँक यू सो मच युअर एक्सलंट प्रेझेंटेशन थँक यू थँक यू थँक यू सो मच आय थिंक दॅट्स ओ देर इज समबडी ऑफ अलका हा सुधीर काका बोला थँक यू व्हेरी मच फॉर एव्हरीथिंग ओ थँक यू थँक यू सो मच थँक यू and we are more knowledgeable today than i was before i attended the lecture <laughs> thank you oh, so much thank you and we needed this you we know needed this. <laughs> we needed this thank you so much <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i'll cut i'll cut like ek one question like we are talking about hypertension but i suffer from chronic low blood pressure mm-hmm. like from ages i have been told that they always get surprised kind of like why are, why is your blood pressure so low and i do get dizziness if i suddenly get sit down and get up and and i have attributed that to a low blood pressure persistent low blood pressure that i have throughout and then um i um, i also get dehydrated very quickly or if i'm dehydrated then i get more of the giddiness and dizziness all of a sudden so and i do consume a lot of garlic <laughs> look at the presentation <laughs> look at the presentation you said that garlic is a good thing to consume if you have high blood pressure yeah so i think uh Ashish ji you should you should consider i mean have you ever checked your sodium potassium levels mm, i don't remember not in past two years potassium i had to check because i used to get those cramps at night and yeah. they checked my potassium and so then i i started eating banana every day and soaked walnuts and that i think i have i don't get them anymore yeah so, so i think if, yeah, just get yourself checked for that those two and anything over consumption of anything is not good so control whatever you are doing because that might be another because i don't know your medical history maybe mm-hmm. we can talk uh, offline yeah. also if you have that would be better i think probably i'll be coming for uh, kaka's uh, i mean yoga shri yoga's uh, meet and greet also so we can talk on that day okay so on uh, uh, january 20th in clarksburg we have uh, meet and greet uh, which many of you are attending and uh, you are very welcome to join uh, there is no charge or anything for that uh, uh, sasha you know you, you are also welcome to join yes we'll be volunteering sorry oh, we'll be happy to help as well okay very good okay i think uh, papa i don't think there are any more questions also okay so the recording will be I, i'll post it on shri yoga if there are some people that are not on shri yoga then uh, somehow can you know, i just send a message to alka or me and uh, uh, then we'll try to get that uh, recording to you if you need it thank you thank you <clears> so thank much alka thank you shri ji and thank you alka excellent thank presentation you. thank you very helpful presentation thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you alka thank you thank you